Greetings to you all, our viewers and listeners living and working in different parts of the world. Welcome to yet another episode of The Conversation. My name is Anotida Chikumbu and I'm your host. And today I'm excited to have Dr. Sarah Rich Dorman, who is a senior lecturer in African politics in the Department of Political Science at the University of Edinburgh. Today we are set to discuss her book, Understanding Zimbabwe, from liberation to authoritarianism. Uh, Dr. Sarah Rich Dorman, welcome to the conversation. If you can just unmute your, your microphone, I can, I can hear you well. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much. How, uh, you are very much welcome. And how is your day going so far? Well, I've been marking and it's our first day of homeschooling here in Scotland. So, uh, you know, busy. Oh, <laughs> I see, I but see. But it's a nice way to finish it. <laughs> I see, I see, I see. So uh, what's the COVID-19 situation like in, uh, in your area? Uh, in my area, it's have you, not... Have you already started work? And if you started, are you teaching in person or you are just doing it all online? Most of our teach, all of our teaching is online at the moment. I think today was the first day of um, our university term as well, but I'm lucky that I'm not teaching this semester. Mm. So um, I'm being spared the worst of that, but my colleagues are all working very hard mm. to, uh, to, to teach from home. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see, I see. That is wonderful, that is wonderful. But I'm very much uh, happy to uh, have you uh, on this show uh, to discuss your book, Understanding Zimbabwe from Liberation to Authoritarianism. I'll tell, I'll tell you something uh, that happened that drew me to have this uh, conversation with you. Uh, as of last semester, I was teaching a class on African history, on uh, modern Africa, and uh, at some point we wanted to pay particular attention to Zimbabwe. And I just asked around some, some friends of mine in the academia that, what, what sort of book can I recommend for reading uh, so that we can uh, have uh, an understanding about the politics of the country? And uh, one of my friends say, oh, there's a book by uh, Dr. Sarah Rich Dorman. I should uh, take a look at it. And I say, oh, it's okay. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me find it. So I got it. I found it interesting. And I'm also going to assign it for this uh, semester. So I needed to, to do this so that we can get to discuss about the book uh, so that we can get the students to watch not only uh, this video, uh, but to as well read the book after having developed interests uh, in uh, reading further the book by uh, having listened to this uh, interview. So uh, I'm very much happy to have you uh, on this show and you are very much welcome. I've seen that your book received quite some impressive reviews and lofty praise uh, from the academic community. Uh, I saw a review that was written by uh, Professor Chipo Dendere, uh, who is at Wesley College here in the United States. I also saw a review that was written by uh, somebody at the London School of Economics. I also saw another one by Lotin Como, uh, who is in South Africa at uh, the University of the Free State. It's, it's quite interesting, uh, and uh, I'm very happy to have you. So now to, to just get us really great to know that your students are reading the book that's just just exactly what any academic wants once exactly exactly and that's the purpose of these talk shows to get the students to know uh, about existing literature uh, so that they develop more interest to go and read uh, such material so um to just get us started uh just before we get to talk about the book can you just briefly uh, uh tell tell us what you teach the classes that you teach at Edinburgh uh, and the kind of subject matter that you engage? Sure. So Edinburgh is quite a big university, um, which means that we have lots of undergraduates, quite a lot of master's students, and also lots of PhD students. My teaching focus is primarily on um, working with PhD students, so I do a lot of supervision, but my main teaching in the classroom is with the undergraduate students, and I teach um, in the political science department um, and the, um, the way the Scottish degree program works is that your first two years are quite broad. You can take a wide range of courses and then, then the second, the last two years you focus in. So it's not dissimilar to the American system that way. 
And so I teach primarily in their final two years, I teach courses on specifically on African politics. So I'm very, very lucky. Many of my colleagues don't have that privilege, so, but I, I've always taught things that are within my research area. Um, so I teach a course um, where um, we look at kind of the, uh, the debates in African politics. So I try to take topics and look at how past academics have studied them and written about them and what the key debates are. So I try to encourage the students to look at the literature, not just at, you know, kind of what's happening today. Um, so that's, um, that's probably the course I, I really enjoy teaching the most. I also have a course called um, Africa and world politics, where we try to take issues and contextualize them and try to think about what are the influences at the global stage, what are the influences at the national stage, and then what are the issues at the local stage, and kind of try to weigh up how those, those dynamics play out and where the power is and where the politics is. Um, but I also have a special course on um, Zimbabwe, a post-colonial state, um, which I thought when I ran it the first time, it would be a one-off. Um, but I've run it a couple, I've run it three times now, and it's really focused. You know, we okay. really just look at Zimbabwe, but then we try to take the issues in Zimbabwe, say, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, nationalism or decolonization or really contemporary issues around elections or um, uh, violence or ethnicity and kind of see what, if we just look at Zimbabwe, but can we then um, think about how Zimbabwe fits into the broader literature and the broader mm -hmm. debate. Mm -hmm. I also teach research methods, which may become pertinent as we talk about the book, because you'll have gathered, I think, that I have an interest in methodology as well. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so why Zimbabwe? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, entirely by accident, I'm sorry to say. Uh, I had uh, an opportunity through the United Nations Association in Canada to do a youth exchange with Zimbabwe, with the Zimbabwe United Nations Association in 1991 which is when Zimbabwe was, um, I was there when the structural adjustment program was announced. So it was a very interesting time to be in Zimbabwe. Um, I found it quite a challenging trip. I was very young. I, um, I, was just, I just started university. Um, it was completely different to anything I'd encountered. Um, but then I went back to my undergraduate degree after six weeks in Zimbabwe and I, I was lucky in that I had, uh, uh, even in my university in Eastern Canada, we had somebody teaching African politics and we had a uh, African history course um, by Chris Yue, who may, some of you may know, he was um, an editor of the Canadian Journal of African Studies um, for some time. And um, both of those, so I, I exped and explored things through the courses and gradually it pulled me away from my prior interests. I got completely consumed with studying Zimbabwe and studying African politics. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, uh, Dr. Sarah Dorman. Uh, so now let's get to the book, uh, Understanding Zimbabwe from Liberation to Authoritarianism. Can we just briefly uh, take us through what you consider to be the core ideas of the book and uh, perhaps its central argument. Yeah. So when I wrote the book, um, I was really trying to understand the, I think the main, the main point would be to try and understand how ZANU managed to stay in power for so long. So I was writing this book in the late 2000s and trying to, um, make sense of the struggles between the people in Zimbabwe who I had worked with and studied, who were from the civic society, from the, the opposition movements. Um, but despite all of that, ZANU continued to win elections. And so I was trying to make sense out of that, that puzzle. It might help to explain that when I started my studies in Zimbabwe, as I said, I was there in 1991 when the Structural Adjustment Program was brought in. And when I went back to Canada and you read what people had written about Zimbabwe, they were all saying, oh, there will be protests like there were in other countries. You know, they say, oh, there will be, you know, political opposition and so forth. But actually there wasn't. I'm not saying that people weren't critical of structural adjustment, but there were not big protests, especially in 1991. Um, there were not kind of, you know, it didn't strengthen the opposition parties like other 
um, like happened in Zambia, for, for example, you know. So I was really trying to understand that, that puzzle. Um, why was Zimbabwe following quite a different trajectory to other countries in, in Africa at that time? Um, and particularly, why was Zimbabwe not doing what, you know, the experts said ought to happen? Um, so as I said, I, this was in part a methodological critique. I was really unsatisfied with the explanations that people gave. And as I went further through my studies of Zimbabwe, I became increasingly frustrated with the, the failure of existing studies to explain the continuities. So what you have is people, you know, in the 1980s, they kind of explain Zimbabwe's stability. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have these later accounts that explain Zimbabwe's chaos and crisis mm -hmm. and violence, you know, after 2000. Mm -hmm. um, but they were almost separate, you know, they were, they were kind of very static. Mm -hmm. And I really felt, I felt that those two periods were linked, that Zimbabwe's stability in the 80s was mm -hmm. actually explained by the same factors as we can explain the violence in the 2000s. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that things didn't change, they did change, but that we needed a theory that explained that change. Mm -hmm. So the title of the book, Understanding Zimbabwe, is not me claiming to understand everything. Okay, it's in yeah. part a methodological critique, it's a, or a methodological claim. It's about a, my approach to research that I'm trying to, to understand rather than to explain. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's about the way in which I, I undertook my research. Um, so it's speaking here to, um, to trying to, to um, work closely with people, understand um, uh, the, the dynamics on the ground, not just do say, you know, survey research or pop in and do a few interviews and then leave again. Mm -hmm. So I was critiquing that, but there's also a really important article called um, Understanding African Politics and the Review of African Political Economy in the early 90s by Chris Allen, who coincidentally um, was my predecessor at, at Edinburgh teaching African politics. And he made this argument about trying to explain African politics in that period of change in the early 1990s, when you have um, many African politics textbooks before that kind of didn't really work once you got into the 1990s. So they kind of explained the 60s and 70s and 80s. But, and so he then, he was critiquing them and saying the problem was a lot of these textbooks that I was taught with, that people were using, explained moments. And so countries kind of jumped from categories. So you had a civilian and then a military or, you know, and, and he made this argument that we should try to explain those processes. So a lot of what the book is about is trying to look at those continuities because I think they help us to explain and understand what happened rather than um, uh, just looking at, at, yeah, just sort of at, at, at moments mm -hmm. because I think they're more connected. And I think that to understand those trajectories and those continuities and why they have meaning over you know, the long durée of Zimbabwean politics, if we can call it that, we have to look at the, um, you know, we can't just look at institutions, we can't just look at you know, the military and force, we can't just look at material things, you know, greed or corruption or, or, or even just basic things like food. Mm -hmm. you know, we have to actually look at how all of those interact. So that's, again, that's the other thing I was really trying to do is to pull together the, an account of Zimbabwean politics, but speaking more broadly to how we study African politics, and I think not just African politics, politics everywhere, and look, think about the fact that we need to look at how institutions work, how elections, how parliaments, political parties work. We need to look at, at rhetoric, at discourse, at culture, mm -hmm. and we need to look at those material things. So, you know, we can't just look at one or the other. Mm -hmm. You'll have gathered that my interpretation here is really shaped by that, that moment in which I emerged into. Yeah. Uh, thinking about African politics. And it may seem very long ago and old to some of you <laughs> younger <laughs> scholars. <laughs> um, and I, I think I kind of needed to write out this long arc of mm -hmm. what I was, what I'd been studying over those years. And now hopefully I can move on mm -hmm. and think about other different newer, uh, newer projects. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's fascinating. It's, uh, it's fascinating because I, I was born in 95, uh, maybe two years after, after structural adjustment. Mm 
So uh, it's it's interesting for us, uh, you know, uh, the born in the 90s to uh, have an understanding of where our country is coming from and where our country is going. Uh, it's, it's very, very important yeah. because we are... Sorry, can I just say, I think again, I think often as political scientists, so a lot of my writing is to some extent a self-critique of my discipline mm -hmm. because I think as political scientists, we often kind of say, oh, we need to understand the history. Mm -hmm. So people will often say, oh, well, we have to understand Zimbabwe's colonized past and the liberation war. Mm -hmm. But then we don't actually work out what that means. We kind of pay lip service to it but we don't actually say, well, what does a liberation war change about a country's politics? Mm -hmm. What does nationalism change? So for example, something else I try to do is to try and unpack kind of the way in which nationalist organizing, nationalist parties, nationalism as a thing, it's not just a, a thing, it actually changes structurally how exactly. mm -hmm. politics works. And so I, I think it's really important, as you say, to understand that history, but to, to I really want us to try and push past that, just kind of saying, well, we know Zimbabwe had a liberation war. We know it had these things, you know, and actually concretely think about how did that shape those political dynamics? Because I think too often, I think I'm guilty of this in some mm -hmm. of my earlier work. It took me a while to get here um, of doing that same thing. And so, so, so um, if we can actually, it's a challenge um, to, again, for us, I'm going to hear I'm speaking very much as a political scientist to not just say, oh, history is important, but actually to build history into our um, our methodology, but also into our actual kind of description and analysis of political processes. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So looking at it, uh, looking at this trajectory of, uh, uh, of saying uh, Zimbabwe at one point or we, we, we were looking at the politics of liberation. Uh, and this is what you, this is the way in which you uh, uh, portray your chapters to say the politics of liberation uh, and so forth, going, going downwards. So now looking at it from the very point at which we say liberation, and then the trajectory to the point at which we say it's now authoritarianism. Uh, I'm sure before you wrote this work or the time around which you, you wrote this work, there were quite some uh, conventional interpretations as in uh, those that sought to explain uh, the Zimbabwean trajectory. What sort of contribution does your work uh, do to that existing body of, of literature? And in, 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 in a way, da, da, does it challenge conventional interpretations or complement some? Sure. So if I can break that into two sections, when we talk about the politics of liberation, um, I've been quite critical of a lot of scholars who've written about um, the influence of liberation politics on Southern Africa, because I think there's a tendency to compare the Southern African countries to each other. So we compare Namibia to South Africa to Zimbabwe and so forth. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I studied Zimbabwe for a long time and spent a lot of time in Zimbabwe. Um, and then after I finished my, my DPhil, my PhD, I taught for a year at the University of Asmara in Eritrea, which had come out of a liberation war even more recently than Zimbabwe had. And that really transformed my thinking about what we mean by the politics of liberation, because Eritrea hadn't had a negotiated transition like, um, you know, Lancaster House. Eritrea and Ethiopia won, well, won the, their battle literally with tanks rolling down the, the streets of the capital. You know, they won literally at the barrel of the gun. So something that I realized is that for all the importance of the military and, and, and fighting in Zimbabwe, most African countries that became independent did not become independent at the barrel of the gun, to use the Ruth first phrase. Most of them had negotiated transitions. Now they were, so that's not to discount the importance of the fighting for liberation. I think that was crucially important. But when you live and work and teach in a country that has actually liberated itself, by, you know, by, by literally winning battles right up to the last minute and then seizing control of the capital city, which is what we see in Eritrea. I realized there are other factors too, but I realized that the trajectory in those countries is quite 
different. The um, the the way in which the um, the new state is founded is 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 quite different. So I've tried to compare Eritrea with Zimbabwe and Southern African countries, or bear it in mind, because what I see when we look at the politics of liberation is that we do have that hugely important trajectory of the liberation war, and that. Um, and particularly, of course, in Zimbabwe's case, the fact that it was a rural war. You know, I think those two factors um, really uh, uh, provide an immense resonance for Zimbabwe's political project. But the actual transition was negotiated. And what we see in that is a process whereby there's a lot of balancing going on. There's a lot of, of processes of trying to build inclusivity and to bring people in to a big tent. Now, nationalist politics, ZANU, ZAPU, the other nationalist parties in Zimbabwe were already big coalitions. They brought people together with really diverse and conflicting interests. So then you have those nationalist parties that had people from all sorts of different backgrounds, also bringing in other groups into independent into the independent politics of Zimbabwe, you get a politics of liberation that is to a large extent about including people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the discourse is about inclusion. Now I'm not saying that people weren't excluded, but mm -hmm. what that discourse of inclusion meant was that it made it really, really difficult for people to be to function outside that, to have a space you know, to function in any sort of a space outside that. So one of the things that I do, um, that I would encourage students to do, if you can get access to copies of the Herald from those years, or any of Zimbabwe's papers, but the Herald in particular, and you look at the, the newspaper coverage, and everybody is being told to, to, to march in step with the new nation. You know, so the women, you know, are, are in churches, and you know, there's this constant refrain of, of coming together. And I think that's shaped by one, that nature of the nationalist politics that is this kind of patchwork of groups you know mm -hmm. fitting together coming but together. not mm -hmm. sorry yeah uh, the, the groups coming together right yeah yeah but you know mm -hmm. they're, they're all it's like a bit of a patchwork you know they're not all homogenous you That's know they right. don't merge it's not a melting pot it's a mm -hmm. patchwork it's groups of people who have come together to fight for you know to fight a common enemy for a common goal and then you get that process of that negotiated transition that then brings even more people in, people who had maybe supported the UANC, white Zimbabweans, you know, not the Rhodesian Front necessarily, but other white Zimbabweans who maybe were a bit dubious, but come on board. So we see the farmers, you know, working with ZANU in those initial years and things like that. So I guess what I would say there is that I do think that in order to understand Zimbabwe's liberation politics, we can't just say, oh, they have guns, they're violent. <laughs> Which is, which is a parody of some of the accounts. I'm not, but you know, to some extent, I think sometimes we just say, oh, it's about, it's all about the military. Actually, it wasn't just about the military. It was about the balancing, the need of the government to balance. So an example here that comes up in one of my latter chapters is the renaming of, of the, um, um, of, of the, um, oh, I've just forgotten the word for it. You know, the, the Tongo, the, the army bases, you oh, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The barracks. The bar barracks, thank exactly. you. Barracks. Yeah. So, you know, I just can't believe that we had barracks in Zimbabwe after, you know, well into the 2000s, you know, you know, nearly 40 years after independence, still named after a British king. You know, how do you have a military barrack? And I think that was because in order to hold that balancing together, the government was actually very reticent. We could say Mugabe, we could say Zanu, but the powers that be were very reticent about highlighting particular individuals and particular activities because it brought out that contestation all those things that we see where were you in the war oh so you know this figure was a hero but this person was more of a hero you know it brought out those contestations so i think that 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 there was a real reluctance we did see some renaming we saw you know we have you know new anthem um new um, street names, things like that, but it wasn't as thoroughgoing or as profound as you see in many places. And so I think in Zimbabwe, you had that very particular need to, to kind of, um, uh, to really unpack that politics of liberation. And I, I only really saw it clearly once I had 
as I said, spent time, you know, living and teaching and researching, um, working with university students in a country which had um, emerged in a very different way from its own very long and bitter liberation struggle. Um, the other thing, since you asked, I said I was going to do this in two parts, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. about a, to come on to authoritarianism, and it's linked to this earlier point. What I realized, what I think was also really important to understand, is the nature of the authoritarian state in Zimbabwe. I think it, it followed what, what we call um, sort of limited pluralism. So it was not totalitarian, it was not autocratic, it allowed, you know, for example, Zimbabwe has always had elections, regular elections. Zimbabwe has always had civil society organizations. And for many decades, those organizations operated within constraints, but it was exceptionally rare for them to be threatened, shut down forcefully, you know, any of those things. Zimbabwe had free press throughout all those years. Now, again, there was self-censorship. There was some external censorship. But for the most part, it continued to print and and, and publish reasonably, um, uh, uh, you know, reasonably diverse literature. If we think about things like Moto and Parade in the 90s, you won't remember these, but there used to be magazines and, you know, there was a real diversity. And so I think, but that there was a tendency on the part of some people watching that to either see Zimbabwe as completely authoritarian or to actually see that superficial limited pluralism and actually if we're going to understand the nature of that authoritarianism it comes back to that issue of balancing that if you if you manage your authoritarianism in a way that is that provides space for most people to be within kind of the the accepted public sphere the public sphere as 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 framed by zanu Mm -hmm. you have uh, you have a really powerful hold over people's imaginations over what is possible over what can be done because it almost becomes impossible to think outside that space what would it be like to be you know to function entirely outside that and in fact there were so many incentives to work within it people had friends cousins relatives um, you know former people they fought with people they'd been in exile with who were in government. You know, people had strong ties to the state. So the Zimbabwean civil society and state were very closely linked throughout much of that period. But again, I think that all ties back to this nationalist politics. It didn't just happen. It wasn't just that there was a small elite, which we see in many post-colonial states. It wasn't just that there was this process of, of um, uh, kind of the building the new nation, but we have a, a, a type of authoritarianism in which uh, just enough space is allowed that it doesn't appear particularly authoritarian, <laughs> but actually people's behavior and constraints are quite constrained. And that's why it makes it much more difficult to organize as an opposition party, as civil society. So when I, um, I spent quite a lot of time in Zimbabwe in the mid 1990s, working with NGOs that were Zimbabwean NGOs, that we're trying to get kind of debates going, discussion going, networks going around things like um, trying to get if, if around government policy, you know, around issues to try and get people to discuss, you know, budgets to discuss, you know, in this, what we now call a public scrutiny of budgets. And things. Constitutional amendments. Constitutional amendments, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So these, these processes that I was studying became or you know, fed into that process of the NCA and the MDC. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when they started out, people were very hostile and suspicious and not quite comfortable with it. And it took quite a while before those. And, and I was really interested in that moment when people were, you know, how do you engage people? And this was my, my, my Zimbabwean colleagues trying to, to do these things, trying to say it's not, you know, that there are real problems in our country. You know, people are, um, being treated unfairly, people are, are, you know, there were questions around access to, to food aid, you know, there were all sorts of things that people wanted to discuss. Um, and I worked particularly with um, church-based NGOs and, um, and, and also with Zim Rights for a while. Um, and they were really concerned to have these discussions, but it was very interesting the way people responded to them. Now, gradually, that sort of state hegemony 
broke down. And that's, but it was that process of contestation that I was really interested in because I think it really revealed the strength, the durability of an authoritarian system that is, that is limited and that is, and that is broadly inclusive. Now, as I said, we know who we know there were people and groups and ethnicities that were very much excluded by the state during those years. I'm not trying to deny that, but I think the overall theme of those years was one that kind of said, of course you can come in, you know, you may have left, you can come in. And this is where we see in unity governments and coalitions, we see this pattern again of, of the discourse as one of bringing people inside. That changes later on and the discourse becomes much more the dominant tone becomes much more exclusionary and mm -hmm. that's when things start to break down and we see that that violence and we see we see the the um the that sort of discursive hegemony that power of institutions becomes weaker and weaker and the violence of the state becomes more and more marked mm -hmm. radically mm -hmm. through the 2000s yeah 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 sure thank you very much for that and looking at it, uh, looking at it, uh, the very fact that um, the liberation war itself, it, it was organized in such a way that uh, command uh, had to be exercised on the people, both during the politicization process of getting the masses to participate in the struggle and in the process of controlling, regulating and uh, imparting knowledge as well as discipline to the comrades that were fighting the war. There was a certain degree of authoritarianism that was required for that, a certain degree of command. Mm -hmm. And so looking at it, it implies the very fact that the ideology of liberation was strongly rooted on authoritarianism. And the transition then to independence was going to obviously uh, get us to a point at which if we have those very same comrades that were uh, exercising command and authority during the struggle, we are going to have that problem. But you have a chapter, uh, you have a chapter that you title Winner Takes All. Yeah. Uh, that partly covers the, the time at which uh, Zimbabwe had the government of national unity. That is the time that we, we had hope that we, we be, began to be optimistic that there might be changes that mm -hmm. might um, that might uh, uh, destroy all forms of these authoritarian and draconian laws, and then usher Zimbabwe into uh, into a new trajectory, a new dispensation that would possibly be much more democratic and deliver on the economic front. But that did not happen, uh, and we we are still trapped in the very in the very the very same problems that we have had in the past as to the very same problems that we have. What could possibly be a problem and what could possibly be the way forward? So can I just say one thing about your, your first point um, about, about authoritarianism within the military and, and kind of that, that, that struggle mentality. I think you're completely right about the importance of command and all that. However, I'm very much a student of Brian Raftopoulos, the Zimbabwean political scientist, labor historian, political scientist, everything. Um, and I think Brian is really right in his emphasis. And he certainly taught me to take seriously this, this idea that within those movements, there were always competing ideas. So he would emphasize that, yes, there was kind of a, uh, uh, you know, an authoritarian trend, but there was also a trend that took human rights and democracy and the voices of the people really seriously. So I think we, we need to see those as, as kind of competing uh, pressures within those, those ideas and norms. And the people were contesting them. Well, we know from people like David Moore and others who studied those periods in the trenches that people were arguing and debating about those things within ZANU, within ZAPU. You know, there was actually uh, contestation over, you know, how do we lead, who leads? What I think maybe people didn't think through enough was how to lead afterwards. And so we have Zimbabwe is a hugely well-educated country um, and we see a very um, technocratic top-down leadership. So decisions were made for people rather than by people afterwards. And I think that's where things start to fall apart. But you asked about the winner takes all. Um, 
So I think that's where we need to look at the state institutions. And that's where we see real similarities between Zimbabwe's politics and politics in many other post-colonial countries. Um, one of my other concerns or critiques early on when I started studying Zimbabwe, and when I, the first thing I say in my book is a critique of treating Zimbabwe as exceptional, as somehow different to other countries. And I think that's wrong because I think that what we see in this zero sum politics, this winner takes all politics, is something that is very typical of post colonial states. And that is, um, as you say, a, a, a politics whereby whoever's in charge of the state grabs everything. And in Zimbabwe, this is a legacy of the Rhodesian state. Um, for all that it had at some points trappings of liberal politics, it also had a very powerful, very controlling state enhanced by the sanctions period. Um, but this is all, we see this also in many other countries where, where the colonial state um, squeezed out a middle class in the settler states that tended to be reserved for either the white settlers or, or, or Asian and other groups who, were, who, who migrated in and became those groups. And so you had uh, a, a, a state whereby um, there was not a power base that could easily, um, a financial power base that could easily stand up against the state because the state's model, the, the politics and economics are so tightly linked that um, the the um, the political to be to be a strong politician you have to have economic resources and to be economically strong you have to have political ties um, and we see this when we think about the relative scarcity of nationalist politicians who emerge um, as business people or with their own financial resources. Most of the people who emerge as nationalist politicians are teachers and, and, and pastors and so forth who are tied into the state. So when, when the politicians become, uh, uh, when, when, when politicians get into power, it's through the state that you can enrich yourself and develop some sort of autonomous, you know, your own resources to further your political career, to, to further your, your ambitions. But there's, there's the, the business sector is tightly, tightly interlinked into the state. And this is what, what the historian Fred Cooper calls the gatekeeper state. And I've tried to develop these, these ideas in, in the writing that I and other people have done to think about how this shapes the post-colonial state, because the problem here is that it is almost impossible to be in opposition. You know, it's really, you know, being in opposition is not just ideologically problematic, because who would, if, if, if the liberation forces brought independence, who wants to be in opposition against the liberation forces? You know, that's a really problematic position to be in if you're a patriotic Zimbabwean, but even financially, you know, there is, it is, it is difficult to be, um, to be outside of the state because the state controls access to import, export, to licenses, to land, as we have seen dramatically in Zimbabwe. So the winner take all nature of the political system is, is shaped by that, the economic basis of the colonial state, which becomes the post-colonial state. So it is really tightly wrapped up. It's, it's tightly connected because of the first past the post political systems. It's the, the nature of the, um, the legacy political institutions that we, that we have from, from the British and the Rhodesian periods. It makes it really difficult to scope out those, those that, um, that uh, uh, space, you know, to be outside. And so the fight is always to win. And we see this, I mean, there's an example that I like to tell my students um, from the election in Somalia, just before Siad Barre took power in a military coup, in which there'd been this intensely expensive, hard fought election. And the day after the election was announced, everybody but one member of the people who had not won, who should have been in the opposition, defected to join the government. <laughs> because there was no point in being in the opposition. Now, Zimbabwe is not that extreme, but you can see why um, people didn't very often try to form opposition parties. We see this also in, in Cote d'Ivoire. There are some very clever um, uh, machinations there around um, uh, uh, the, essentially the, what created a single party. I, I won't bore you with comparisons, but you know, we have this, this um, 
this, this dynamic. And I think until that is unpacked, it's going to be very, very difficult um, to move past that winner takes all politics because the stakes are so high. You know, if you've, if you've been a minister, if you've been in government, the, there are so many people relying upon you, depending upon you, so much pressure, both kind of egotistically, you know, just kind of the glory of being in government. You know, we don't want to lose, you know, we can look at Donald Trump for that. Um, but also this, um, you know, this, this, uh, uh, the, the real politique of the way the systems work mean that once you are no longer in government, you are nothing, you're fully outside. So I think that's what needs, and, but that's incredibly hard to unpack. And I guess that's why I'm giving you these examples. We have really on the African continent, just the example of Ghana, where we have seen regular rotation from one party to another, you know, where you can see that it, you can go from being in opposition and then get back into power. And I think that's a really, um, that, that, that takes that pressure off from that zero sumness. But that's a really, that's a, a, a difficult, I mean, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, I know, and people who know these issues will be saying, oh, she's oversimplifying, I am. But <laughs> I still think the basic point holds here. Um, and it's not just this, you know, idea of a turnover test or whatever. I'm not trying to say it's that simple, but I do think it's, a, it's about um, re, reforming, I'm sorry if there's some background noise. <laughs> it's the problems of working from home. Um, but that's the challenge of working of, of these sorts of, of um, um, political and economic systems that are so tightly bound together that it's really, it, it, it's really difficult to unpack them and it's difficult to make it, um, make it possible for, um, for, politics to become less, yeah, less, you know, for, for so much to be bound up, bound up in politics. And, you know, in, I was thinking of something else you said earlier, and, you know, in Zimbabwe for many years, elections were shaped primarily by the electoral role. You know, Zimbabwean politics for many, were not, for the most part, have not historically been, been rigged by, you know, ballot box stuffing or any of those things. But we have a long, long trajectory of the electoral role being shaped and controlled. Now, that goes back decades. <laughs> you know, that is not something that you can just suddenly, you know, that, that, that observers can spot or that can just suddenly be changed. You know, these are, these are structural they're built into those systems and how those systems work and, and the ways in which they are, um, they are organized and, and the ways in which they reproduce themselves through subsequent generations of civil servants and politicians. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Sarah Dorman. I'm very, very, very much happy to have heard you on this episode of The Conversation. We've been joined by lots of people, uh, lots of students that have been posting. Can I say hi, Mom? What? <laughs> my mom's out there. Wonderful. Oh, nice, 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 nice. That is great. We've been joined. Uh, they've been sharing their thoughts. Uh, they've been following the discussion. This is the platform where I get to sit with established academics uh, to have a discussion of their outstanding publications. Uh, and to also have a discussion of some uh, key topics, uh, key topics that uh, uh, of issues affecting the continent at large uh, and specific individual countries in particular. Uh, I do often sit with not only scholars, but young, uh, young people and international newsmakers to have uh, a face-to-face -face discussion. Viewers and listeners, uh, Dr. Sarah Rich Dorman is with the University of Edinburgh and a copy of this book can be accessed on Oxford University Press, uh, a copy that was published in 2017. I'm going to paste the link on the comment section so that uh, you can get to access it. Dr. Sarah Dorman, I'm very happy to have heard you. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thanks so much. That is wonderful. Thank you. Bye-bye.